everybody. This is Brian Kelly, CEO of the amazing Prison Entrepreneurship Program, here for another edition of PEP Talks. And I have got an outstanding interview for you today. I think you're really going to be blessed by it. But I, I want to start it out by talking about the disunity that's going on in the country, the, uh, the unrest, the racial division, the economic division, the lack of economic opportunity that's going on in our country and that is fueling this fire. Um, and it is so real. And, you know, it's amazing to me. We have been empowering um, minorities in PEP for 16 years. We've been doing it since before it was cool. And uh, I really do believe that we have a solution for what's going on in the country where people can find real purpose and a way to get there and new vision and the support structures around it, where we come together across racial lines, socioeconomic lines, um, uh, gender, age, whatever. We come together as a family with a new purpose, new vision, new heart, and, and new opportunities. And I think you're going to hear that come out in the interview today. And so let me uh, get right to it. I want to introduce to you an amazing member of Estes Extreme 17. Would um, you introduce yourself? Appreciate you, Brian. My name is Jose Contreras, a.k.a. Scrappy Doo. Maybe Adam Scooby, proud owner, founder, and inventor of Better World Products, offering better solutions for a better world. Wow, that's awesome. You still remember your pitch, don't you? Wow, that's fantastic. So uh, you were at the Estes Union, went through Extreme 17. How long have you been out? I've been out about a year and a half now. Wow, you're doing exceptionally well. I'm so proud of you on that. Let's go back a little bit, though. Um, how many times have you been in prison? I've been in prison five times. Ooh, five times. Wow. Okay. Uh, the last time that you were up, no, the last time that you were uh, in prison, how much time did you do? Uh, this last time that I was in prison, I actually did seven years. Seven years for? Um, two assaults on a police officer and possession of firearm by a felon, which were originally aggravated assaults. Wow. Aggravated assault. That. Joey, that, <laughs> that just doesn't resonate with the man that I know today, and so I, I want to dive down into that a little bit. Will you tell me what what did it look like to be Joey before prison? Because I can't <laughs> I can't reconcile uh, that story. Yeah, so uh, like he said, um, I'm not the man I used to be. Um, I'm reborn in uh, in Christ's creation, God's creation. So I was actually straight chaotic. Um, I ran in around the streets. I did drugs. I committed violent crimes. I uh, ran with gangs for a long time. Um, basically, I just created havoc and anarchy everywhere I went and not caring. Um, one of the things I used to say was that I was good at being bad. You're good at being bad. You've also told me that you were, uh, you're in gangs, you're an enforcer, you fought a lot, yes, you were a pretty violent guy, yes. and you found you were good yes. at being violent? Yes, I did. So that was one of the biggest things was that uh, I didn't do too well at school. So I did all right, but I wasn't like my older brother and maybe my other brothers. Uh, my home life was good. My parents worked. So I took to the streets. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the streets, I actually found people that accepted me. And one of the things, I didn't need no book smarts. I didn't need none of this stuff. I just needed violence. And I actually excelled in the streets through violence and acts of violence. But, so you also told me that there was something about your characteristic about you <laughs> that kind of displayed how crazy you were. Yes. Um, so I actually ran the streets, so I hung out with a lot of bikers. Um, you know, uh, did a lot of stuff for them when I was younger. And I also hung out with a lot of uh, sharp skinheads and uh, punk rockers. So I ran around the street with blue hair or different color hair, but mostly I kept my hair blue uh, a lot in those streets. <laughs> well, I find that hard to picture with you with blue hair, uh, but what we do have a picture, I think, <laughs> of that. We might take yeah. a look at So uh, you get your charge, burglary charge, uh, you go to prison, you end up where? Um, so I ended up going through actually uh, a couple of units, but this last one I ended up at Garza West. Um, I wasn't in there that long, um, and I actually got into fights. I mean, that's all I knew how to do. I mean, that's what I did. You know, it kind of fits well in that environment, yeah. doesn't it? You know, then that's one one spot that I actually excelled at. So you know, I, it was kind of rough when I first went in when I was 18, but now this last time I was kind of I guess well seasoned in it. So I was able to go in, adapt, learn how to do what I did, and uh, it got me shipped off the unit really, really quick. Where'd you go then? 
Um, I actually got put in medium custody, and medium custody really is, I guess, for the knuckleheads, as we want to say, the guys who cannot uh, fit in or do right. We they say, okay, you know what? We're going to group y'all together so we can watch y'all better and uh, control y'all from that environment. Y'all beat up and hurt each other and kill each other. So we're just going to leave y'all in there together. Did you qualify to be in, in that group? Oh, yes, I did. And uh, I actually ran quite a bit of them in there. Wow. So you continued what you've done on the street and violence and, and, you know, and all that? Okay. So you were at East Ham. Was there a moment when the light came on? <laughs> uh, yes. So I was at East Ham, and I actually got let out to population at East Ham. Um, and I got put on P-Line. And P-Line is kind of like you're not all the way free in this population yet. You're in between from the knuckleheads. Just let's see what you're going to do. you got to be without picking up any violent cases within a year, which wasn't helping. Um, and there was this older man that we called OG. Um, and OG basically was giving me advice all the time. And he was just, like, telling me a lot of knowledge, a lot of useful uh, things. He had been there for 25 years already, oh, wow. locked up on that same unit. And um, one day I asked him, you know, like, like, bro, why are you so smart? Like, how do you know all these things? And you've been here for 25 years. Right. And he kind of told me, well, it's because of Jesus Christ. So then and naturally I was like, nah, I'm good. And uh, But I couldn't deny the feeling and the knowledge that he had given to me. Wow. So he introduced you to scripture, to yes, eternal truths. Uh, was there a time when... You prayed out or reached out to God? Oh, yes, I did. So he planted the seed and watered it, and God provided the increase. One night, he just said, ask for God. Ask for God for anything. You know, God is a strong God. He is an all-powerful God. He will provide for you. Got down on my knees. Hopefully nobody was watching. Got down on my knees. I prayed. I cried. I said, God, if you're real, if you're real, take me out of this, this hellhole. Take me out of this darkness. I do not want to be this no more. I cannot look at my life. I'm coming up on 40 years old at that time. I cannot be here doing this anymore and leading these youth into the wrong direction that I'm being led. And because I was continuously still recruiting people into the game. Wow. So you cried out for God. You cried out basically for deliverance. Yes, what I happened? Um, well, less than a week, I was uh, plucked from that unit and put on chain, which is basically a transfer to a new unit, a housing unit, and I got sent to Venus, Texas, to the east, uh, to the SS unit. Wow, that just happens to be the unit where PP uh, yeah. operates their program. But you didn't get pulled over there for PP. No, I did not. You got put in general population. Did you hear about PP when you were there? Yes, I did. Uh, so when I went in, the warden actually told me, if you got more than three years, you shouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Keep your head down. So there's no way I should have been there at that time. So why I thought, because I was still believing in myself instead of something greater. Um, so they told me about PP when I got there, because I got housed in a PP overfill dorm. And they said, watch out, PP are snitches. They're going to tell on you. You got to watch out for them. Don't trust them. It's us against them. Mm, wow. Is that what you encountered from PP guys? Um, no. So actually, I had one black, one white, and one Mexican approach me. Mm -hmm. Um. And anybody that's been in prison knows that. That's typical, right? Yeah, so when they approach you, you're going to fight one of each race to see where you're at. And I guess they, they call that a blender, right? Yeah, they okay. call that a blender. And they're going to put you on the picking order. Mm -hmm. um, and so they actually, instead of with hate, they approach me with love. And they're like, hey, brother, how you doing? We're PP. And I'm like, oh, okay. And they're, but they're like, you know, if you want something greater in your life, you know, you want something better, let us know and we can help you out with that. So I still wasn't hearing God's plan at the time. I was still in my flesh. Okay. Okay. So how did you get introduced to PP? Um, so there's actually this man named Sergeant. Um, well, actually, a kid. He was a lot younger than me. Way more knowledge. Uh, God works in mysterious ways. Uh, so I come down from my room early in the morning, and I mark my spot. Nobody moves my seat. Nobody touches my stuff. Or we're going to fight. So I kind of see him sitting where I sit. There's nobody else in the day room. You know, it's early in the morning, nobody's out there, and I tell him, what are you doing in my seat? Are you trying to test me? You know what, Let's, don't forget about that. Put your shoes off, meet you on the stairs, we're going to fight. And he looks at me with his face like, like I'm just asked ask, ask <laughs> something uh, out the ordinary. And he was like, he was like, for real, over his seat? He's like, bro, you can have this seat and anything around it. I will move. 
because I'm not here for that. So it made me feel really stupid. So I still wanted to fight him. Okay. Walked up the stairs, but instead of anger, I was walked up there in stupidity, really. So a VP gag, uh, guy gave you a new uh, reference, a new way to look at life. Did, did that impact you? Uh, yes. So I went up to my room. I still put my shoes on, but I did not come out that room the same person. Um, I actually came out that room humble, went down to him, and this man was black as well. Mm -hmm. So I was still on the race thing, and I was like, I've never said sorry before, really, to anyone. Um, and I told him, man, I apologize to you. I apologize to you for coming at you the way I did. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead and sit there. Um, and me and him actually became good friends after that. So you, you bring up a, a point, and, you know, going back to the blender, too, and the, the racial disunity that goes on in prison. It, I think it's the most racially charged place in this country. What would you say? Um, I, believe you, I believe you're right. Because I didn't go in racist, I'll tell you that. Um, I didn't even know I was Mexican when I went into prison. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know? What do you mean by that? Dude? So I don't speak Spanish. Um, I know a few Spanish words and uh, things from being locked up. But uh, really quick, I went in there, and I hung around with a lot of bikers, like I said, gang members. But our thing was, if you're violent enough and you got that street cred or whatever they may call it, you're cool. You can hang with us. You know, it, it, it's the alpha males. Violence doesn't know any boundaries. Violence doesn't know no, no color. color. Wow. Violence doesn't know color. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, so let's talk about how did you get into PEP? Um, so those guys uh, that had approached me in the beginning, after that ordeal with Sergeant, I was like, you know what? I said, I'm going to go check this out. So PEP had this door we used to walk to when we come out of chow, and it said PEP in there. Mm -hmm. And you hear all kind of sounds, music, dancing, everybody be looking in, laughing making fun of the guys, and uh, I walked in there. And as soon as I walk in, I approach this man at the table. I say the gatekeeper, uh, Mr. Gami Hassel. Um, Gami is our in-prison manager at the Estes unit and uh, also a graduate of the program. Yes. So when I approached him, I told him, man, and I went to him, like, needing help. And I looked at him, and I said, Gami, man, I said, excuse me, sir, um, I'm really interested in PP. I need help. The guys who asked me to go there got up and were like, hey, Gami, this is the guy we're talking about. Gami didn't give two cares. He just looked at me, got an application, said, here, fill this out, come back. Wasn't bothered by it. Mm -hmm. I guess people walk in there all the time. Uh, went home, filled it out, came back to PEP. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Gami. I, get, I told him, hey, Gami, I got my, uh, my application right here. He gets it, doesn't even look at it. He's sitting there reading his paper. Gets it and throws it in a filing box on the desk. It keeps going. So now I'm back in my flesh, and I'm like, did he just disrespect me? Did he just throw my application in the trash or the filing box? Um, I said, you know what? I'm not leaving. I said, do you mind if I check out the class got me and just see what y'all are about? And he just goes, go ahead. Um, I sat in that seat. And I showed up every day all week. Uh, I basically snuck into the class. So you just refused not to come. I refused not to come. Wow. You kicked door. You, yes, you I did. Your way into I used what I learned what I used to do in the streets in PEP for the right reason. For the right reason. I like that. So what did you encounter? What did you find about the program that you really gravitated to? Um, I'd say not only the accountability was one of the biggest parts of it. Um, actually, for the right reasons. So... When you're in the gangs and when you're in prison, everybody wants to hold you accountable for the wrong reason or it's beneficial for them and their cause. But it's never to build you up for the betterment of your family. So that was one of the biggest things with me. And going in there and just seeing so many men, and these were men being vulnerable, coming from so many backgrounds, and not caring about skin color. So that mixed together was something really big. Um, during class, were there any of our volunteers that, you know, we introduce our participants to just an incredible cadre of volunteers who uh, you just can't engage yeah. any other program? Who were some of them that really impacted your life? So I first want to mention Linda, Linda Thomas, and Carl. Um, Linda was a blessing. She, I would go to her all the time. And, um, you know, and I was making the transition, even if I made it internally, outward, I didn't know how to dress. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know how to comb my hair. I was still shaving my head bald or bald fade. So, What's wrong with that? <laughs> yeah, and she was like, you know, wear purple. 
or this would look good on you, or grow your hair out, comb it to the side. Wait a minute, you weren't wearing purple in prison. No, I was okay. not wearing purple in prison. Wait, we just clarify that. But, uh, and also, too, uh, Scott Haygood. Scott Haygood played a big part in my life. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to cry, too. Uh, so Scott would actually spend his time every day with us, and generally, he didn't have to be there. Him or Keith Berg, which was another one, and they didn't have to be there at all. And they would sit there and just talk about their family. Talk, me and Keith would talk about his kid. We would talk about trips. They would, they would open up and just tell us everything and anything. And Scott would pull out his little book out of his pocket of knowledge, of little mm -hmm. quotes, and he'd speak to us. And he'd just say, I just want to leave you with this. And he'd pull something out. And every day I look forward to hearing something from him. So, you know, we're talking about the program on the inside, and I hear you talking about character <laughs> and men and, you know, working together and stuff and not very little about business. Which What's more important, the character portion or the business portion? So, the character, I would honestly say, you know, business is important. Uh, financial literacy, going into these boardrooms, going into uh, certain jobs that I had, I had a basic understanding, and I was very knowledgeable of what they were speaking of. I wasn't just left them in the dark. Uh, but if your character is not right and you're not walking into these rooms with just a sense of like not only self-worth, but that you belong and your character is right to speak to these people, it, it, it makes a, the whole difference. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay, now let me wait. Now you said earlier that you're in gangs in prison, but you're in PP and we don't take gang members in there. Oh, there's a disconnect yeah. there. What happened? So, you know, big surprise. I'm no longer in a gang. Hmm. Um, Good. We appreciate that. <laughs> so uh, I rep PP now. So one of the biggest things with me was um, I actually went to David Flores, which is another in prison management. Me and another guy named Angel Herrera, which is known he passed away. Um, so we went to him and we're like, look, we're in gangs. How did you get out? What should we do? And basically David said, you got to bite the bullet and go out there. You got to, you know, and uh, we'll do what we can for you, but you need to cut those ties before you actually move on to anything else because you can't straddle the fence. So That's tough to do normally on another unit. Are you able to just get out of gang no, when you want to? No. So most likely uh, some units you'll be hurt really bad, stabbed. Uh, Perhaps killed? Killed, yeah. So what was your encounter when you went and told the gang that you wanted to get out at, at, at this so unit? I gathered everybody up who I believe would have a voice. And I let them know that I wanted something greater. And at first they're like, nah, it's cool. You know, your PEP, we don't expect you. You're still down. I'm like, no, I don't want to be down no more. I want to be out. Well, down means you're still connected to the gang. Yeah, you're still connected to the gang, but we'll just keep it undercover because you're PEP. Mm. And I was like, nah, I can't do that. Mm. can't do that, bro. And uh, I'm, I'm out. Do what y'all wish to do with me. If y'all want to fight me, here it is. Y'all know where my cell's at. Please do not jump me in the middle of the child hall or anywhere. I said, I got a cell or we got the rake yard. We could do something. Um, but I was like, I trusted in the Lord. And I trusted in brothers that were there leading me in the right path. Mm, wow. So I, I know that you graduated in class, and but you didn't immediately get out. Matter of fact, you were there for quite a while longer. And you became one of our uh, longest-term peer educators. You want to talk about the leadership skills that you learned? Uh, so, yes, I was a peer educator for three years. Um, I actually jumped up right after I graduated. I got moved into a peer educator position. Um, man, not only leadership skills, but accountability, but also identifying somebody's character. Mm. So there's a big difference in like going at somebody and addressing them because of your own personal issues or addressing their character and how to approach a person on tact, which took me a long time to uh, approach somebody with a good tact coming from the background I had. Well, you know, you do that so well now. It's hard for me to even see the, the guy that you used to be because you are so grace-filled and so loving and so patient with everybody. That, that's amazing to me. So let's talk about you. So you finally get out. A um, year and a half ago, what was that like? Um, amazing. Um, I'm, instead of going back to my hometown, um, something told me to come to Dallas. Mm -hmm. Here's a $50 bus ticket. Yeah, they're going to pick you up at the walls, PEP, and just – Trust. Um, I got out on a monitor, went to the O'Brien house. Um, it was it was a shock. It was a shock. Um, walked in the rain on monitor, uh, started getting a job. A friend got me a job at Benihana, started working there, excelled to a hibachi chef, 
uh, making good money really quick. Um, and then David Flores started picking me up, taking me to church, and uh, getting me lined up and, and on the right path with the Lord. You know, that's amazing. He is an amazing hibachi chef, and I've taken a couple of groups to uh, Benihana's, and you've been our chef before, and he's super entertaining, uh, super skilled along those lines. And we had about, I don't know, 10 people uh, from VP who are working there. As a matter of fact, there were some, some visitors that are on the same table, and we were getting so much attention, they looked at us and said, are you guys celebrities or something? Or, well, yeah. in certain circles, we might be, right? Okay. And so you did, you were working at Benihana's, you excelled there. Uh, were you also working another job on the side? Uh, yes. So I actually went to work for Spectrum and Telecloud Voice, and I was doing sales. So a lot of the stuff from Integrity Selling, um, David Rains, what he showed us, um, you know, just went right over to what I started doing, making really good money on the track to make uh, about 100000 a year uh, doing that. Um, and PP lined up straight with it. But also to that, the big part, integrity selling. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't where my heart was. It wasn't on my values as far as me being a Christian, as far as me, you know, just exploring new avenues. So, okay. So it wasn't jiving. You knew that's not where you wanted to be. Uh, you moved on. Where are you working now? Uh, so now I'm working for Cornbread Hustle. Mm -hmm. So I work with two amazing bosses, uh, Sherry and Vlad. And they took me in with open arms, didn't know how they're going to put me on their payroll, didn't know how they're going to make ends meet. They were still struggling at the time. Um, and they took me in and said, look, this is what we can do for you. We have faith in you. And they gave me a job, great pay, uh, great hours. I'm basically the lead over uh, the whole disinfection crew for, uh, for everything. And um, they since grown tremendously since then. And it's just a, a whole nother family, but the basic part of it is their values that they have. Wow. And if, you know, if any place is about values and they've got you, you're in the right spot. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you have been a house manager for us at the transitional house for quite a while, too. And so you get to work with the guys a lot. And so uh, talk a little bit about just engagement with the brotherhood in living in the transitional house. So... I love my brothers. I love my brothers so much. And a lot of them know me from being in there. They used to call me super cop uh, <laughs> because I'm all about accountability. Amen. I'm all about, okay, so if you say this, this, and this, let's live up to that. And if you falter out of love, I'm here to tell you that you're stumbling, brother. Let's get back on track. Whether they wish to hear it or not, that's on them. At least I know personally that I approached them. So I've been there for about a year, been a house manager, uh, basically just, you know, reinforcing the brothers that, that they made the right decision every day, that when they're struggling and when they're hurting and when they're doubting, to just give them a shoulder to lean on. It's not sympathy, but empathy. And like you said, not a hand out, but a hand up in what we what we provide. And when they're able to do that, not only do they acquire the tools out here, but they're able to pass that on to the next man. So no longer will we become clock tellers, time tellers, but clock builders. Mm -hmm. So. So uh, let me ask you this. It, it, in your experience, uh, do you get out and everything goes great? It's all rainbows and unicorns and you never encounter obstacles no. or curveballs? It, I would say, uh, man, it, it, it's hard. It's hard. But uh, we reject passivity. I would say on a daily basis you're going to run into about 10 things that rub you the wrong way or things that are thrown your way. But that's where we come from. We come from a lifestyle where it wasn't all unicorns and peaches and rainbows, you know, and we come from a lifestyle that, you know, you got to keep moving with everything going on. So, you know, it, it just transfers over for the positive thing. So I'm going to assume then it hasn't all been perfect for you. As a matter of fact, I think we could talk about a little investment that you made into a truck. You want to tell us a oh, little yeah. about your truck? So you got to bring that up. Yeah, okay. i got to bring that up. Right? So, we're, we're here to tell the truth. Yes, we are. Um, and it's and it's testimony is something I can tell y'all. So, I, I buyer's impulse. I got out, went with a brother to go check out a car. The guy there was like, "Hey, why don't you come over here and just see if you get approved?" And I was like, "No, I won't." I ended up getting approved. You know, um, approved. Approved. So he's like, "Give me fifteen hundred dollars. You can drive off in this truck. Big, nice truck, all black, lifted, um, twelve miles per gallon kind of truck." Uh, Custom made front oh, grill, man. jumbo motors, lift kit. I love, I love that. I'm a country boy at heart, and I fell in love with this truck. He's seen it. Um, so 
in the end, the truck was probably worth about seven grand. He charged me uh, fourteen, fifteen thousand, and I was paying two twenty-two percent interest on it. Wow. So it was I was uh, upside down for real. So did anybody in your network tell you, oh, man, bad choice? This man, right? uh, I'm probably not the only one. Well, yeah, uh, Gami. <laughs> After Gami uh, sat me up on my head a couple times, me and Gami actually became really good friends. Uh, him, David, uh, all the brothers at the house that knew anything about it that were actually asking, like, how much do you pay for that truck? Instead of just saying, oh, that's a nice truck. You know, oh, I love your truck. But they're like, bro, how much are you paying for that? Is that within your budget? Isn't that accountability in action? Yes, it is. So what we instilled on the inside is really bearing fruit for you on the outside. Mm -hmm. So you've got this truck you really can't afford. Your brothers come to you and say, bad idea. We love you. Bad idea. Yeah. Get out of that, right? Yeah. Did you get out of that? Yes. Um, so I recently, I recently got out of it. Uh, about a few weeks ago, Brian Kelly was down. And I was talking to Gami as well. And they're like, no. Like, you need a eject toe, seat toe. You need to get out of there, <laughs> for real. I called uh, On The Road Lending. Um, they actually helped me out tremendously. Um, very, very, they walked me there all, the whole step of the way. I was able to get into a 2018 Honda Civic, uh, 20,000 miles on it, 150,000 mile warranty. Still has the factory warranty on top of that. I paid less than $20 for a full tank of gas to get to 300 some miles which I'm grateful for. Uh, and my, I say my bill, my monthly bill and my insurance is less than my car, truck payment I was paying a month. Wow. I, you know, I've, I've seen uh, Joey in that car, and it's a super professional-looking car. I know your gas mileage is better. You're in a much better position. You can afford that car. That car is going to carry you into the future. Amen. And, and I'm proud of you for stopping that slide and, you know, maybe it was the wrong decision at first, but you stopped that and, and got back on board with something that was going to work better, that your community told you was a better mm -hmm. uh, move for you. What an amazing story in so many levels. Um, what about family? Have you connected with family since you've been out? Um, yeah, so I've seen my mom and my kids. Um, I've yet to go down and visit my dad. Um, you know, they all live together. But I, I was about to, and then all this COVID stuff hit. Um, and then recently, my mom, she's better now, and the kids, but they had all caught COVID, so uh, they were really sick for a while. Uh, my whole family, my, my son and everybody caught it. So uh, it's kind of been a, just another stumbling block, or not a stumbling block, but a hurdle, I would say, just something more that we got over. But I, I stay in constant contact with them. I'm always on social media with them, with my 18-year-old son, which I love to death. We don't want to, you know, but uh, it, it's good. It's good. So uh, what does the future have in store for Joey Contreras? What do you want to do next year, next five years, ten years? What's that look like? So um, I actually want to get either into real estate or rental property. Um, that's my biggest goal is using my IDA money, which I'm involved in with Watermark Church as well, mm -hmm. um, to, to get a piece of land, mm -hmm. to acquire something, and then give an opportunity as well. Like So buy a piece of land, get the septic, get the electrical, start getting trailers, and brothers that I see that are on the right path that just need that hand up, offer them great living conditions for a reasonable price, mm. and not only was that helping them out, setting them on the right foot with their family, but that's creating passive income for myself and the future and legacy of my family. So you want to get into real estate, uh, rentals, uh, being a landlord, there might be some volunteers who would be interested in Helping you and counseling you, hey, being a mentor for you along those lines. I, I think that's wonderful, Joey. There's no doubt in my mind that you're going to be successful in everything that you do. You know, I want to stop here and say that what an amazing um, testimony of transformation from somebody who was a gang enforcer who became a servant leader. Uh, you know, Joey gave up um, violence to have love. He gave up a gang to have real family. Uh, he gave up hatred uh, uh, to have love. And, uh, it's amazing. Uh, you gave up a broken um, past to have a bright, shiny future, and it's amazing to me. You are going to be super successful in everything that you do, and I'm so proud of you. You're a great example of BB.